Acts 2, 42 to 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods they gave, gave to everyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Let's pray for Stuart now as he comes and brings the message to us. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that although it was written many, many years ago, it's alive and active and is relevant to us in these days. Father, we pray for Stuart that you will give him freedom of speech and a real sense of your presence as he delivers what you've laid on his heart to us. And Father, give us open hearts and open minds to receive all that you want to give us this day. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Restore Living Room, where I have the privilege of continuing our House to House series uh, with you this morning. Um, I hope lockdown is going okay for you. Um, firstly, thank you so much to Ian and Maria from Albany Church. Um, we've been so uh, excited to journey with them over the last year uh, as they've uh, sought to become uh, part of the Restore family. It's fantastic to have all of you joining us on the live stream every week. And uh, thank you for that reading. And it's great to have you guys with us. Uh, this morning, uh, I want to talk about how do we follow Jesus better together? Uh, and interestingly, that was the Jack Johnson song on the Pearson's video as well, Better Together. And really, that's uh, what I want to think about this morning. But before I get into the gist uh, and the main bit of the message, I want to just ask you a question. And that's, how are you really? Uh, and I think what's really interesting in this time is there's so much going on in the world that uh, emotionally, uh, all of us are kind of feeling a bit on edge, feeling a bit more vulnerable than we would normally. And so uh, why don't you just take a minute to just uh, maybe take a deep breath and just be aware of uh, where your emotions are at this morning. Um, and um, a couple of weeks ago, I managed to have a week off um, from um, just uh, doing everything I was for church. And it was so good to just take a, a breath and to stop uh, the pace of life. The pace of life, uh, certainly if you're in a busy family, doesn't seem to have quietened down uh, despite the lockdown and some of the other things going on. So how do we uh, quieten ourselves uh, and have that space? And I just want to recommend a book to you uh, by John Mark Comer called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. Um, it should be on your screen now. And it, it just really um, ministered to me. It, it talks about how do you find rest in the midst of a, a crazy pace of life? How do you find rest uh, in the midst of all the things that are going on? Uh, and so uh, he pulls out some of the key teachings of Jesus, some of the ways that Jesus would say, this is how to live, and then how de Jesus demonstrated it as well. So um, if you're looking for a book to read during this time, I would thoroughly recommend getting that and having a look at it. Um, our passage today comes from Acts 2, and I want to particularly start with verse 42, uh, which says the following. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And what I love about this series uh, is that in this time, we're getting back to the basics. Uh, the early church is often a picture of what should church be? What should we prioritise? What should we put first? And so some of these things, I love Jody's message last week on the breaking of bread. Actually, it's such a central teaching to our faith and our belief in Jesus. Uh, what if we made it a bit more of a central part of what it means to follow Jesus together? And we can do that in our homes. Uh, today, I want to look at fellowship. But before, I thought, um, I love this phrase, they devoted themselves to. And so I want to ask you a question. What are you devoting yourselves to right now? If you're watching with other people, maybe have a little conversation. If you're watching on your own, maybe you can put something in the chat. Here's some options of things you might be devoting yourself to right now. Eating, sleeping, worrying, surviving, Netflix, going for walks every day. What is it that you're devoting yourselves to? Maybe it's avoiding other people in your house. Maybe you've just got to get a bit of space. Whatever it is, we devote our lives to different things. 
but we often do it without thinking, what are we actually um, investing our time, investing our, ourselves in? And so my question is, what are you devoting yourselves to? Uh, and the word um, that I want to look at from the rest of the passage today is fellowship. Now, that's quite a strange word. Uh, in fact, I'm not sure it gets used very much outside of Christian circles. But I have a trivia question for you. What is a popular film from the last 20 years that had the word fellowship in it? So we're looking for a, a blockbuster movie from the last 20 years with the word fellowship in it. Again, tell the people around you if you know, uh, maybe post it on the chat. I'm about to reveal it. It is, of course, Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring. And there we have our fellowship, our nine companions, uh, a wizard, some, uh, an elf, a couple of men, some hobbits, and a dwarf. And if you don't know the story of the Lord of the Rings, particularly the Fellowship of the Ring, the basic premise is that these companions have a ring that they have to destroy. It's a quest. It's a journey that they go on together. And during that time, they are devoted to one another. They prefer one another. They protect one another. And in the film, they use language such as, if by my life or my death I can help you, then I'm in. And I thought it was an amazing picture of what I think Jesus is talking about when he talks about fellowship and when the early church devote themselves to one another in order to kind of replicate the, the community that they've experienced with Jesus while he was with them. And so fellowship, that sense of a quest, a journey, being together, preferring one another, having each other's backs. This is the kind of close-knit community that we're talking about when we talk about the early church and the blessings that then come from, uh, from that point. But the word that's translated fellowship can actually be translated in other ways as well. It's the Greek word koinonia. And I want to show you a couple of other places that it appears in the New Testament. And we're going to read through those together. Firstly, in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 13, it says the following, They will glorify God because of your submission flowing from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution, which is translated from koinonia, for them and for all others. A sense of uh, needing to contribute something into, into the mix of the community. And secondly, from Philippians 3, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share or may koinonia in the sufferings like him in his death. Again, two different uses of the word. They are translations of the word contribute and share. But again, it's talking about a community that's together, not just uh, kind of opting in a little bit or kind of being on the edge. It's talking about giving what you have to be part of. Um, the community that's there, a connection to God, but also to one another, not just in terms of spiritually, but materially and with the things that we have as well. And then Acts 2 verse 44 again uses the same word, koinonia. It says all the believers were together and had everything in common. It's that same word again, koinonia. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. What would it look like today for us to have everything in common with one another? It's probably one of the strangest times that anyone's ever tried to speak about fellowship than when we're physically separated from one another. And yet into this context, it may be as a good time to ask, how do we do it better? How do we prefer one another? How do we invest in relationship with one another to get this kind of deep, wonderful, sense, selfless community together? That's more than just friendship. It's more than just being uh, with other people. And I think lockdown's really challenged us. It's really challenged us uh, in this time in terms of relating to one another. And as we can't physically relate to one another in the same way, it's pointed and it showed us how much we value relationship with one another. It showed us how much we need that connection with other people. Particularly those people who are self-isolated right now. Uh, maybe in isolation for a number of months. That's a really tricky challenge. How do you do that when you're used to being with so many people all the time? But it's a real challenge that we have to face. That's why we've worked hard to create online connection points. We've got our chat hosts and our prayer team available to pray with you right now if you wanted to click on the chat. That's part of us wanting to be more available and connect with people in this time. We've got our online hospitality area after the service where we'll run a Zoom uh, and a quiz. But really, it's about seeing each other's faces and recognising that we are together. Genesis 1.18 says it's not good for man to be alone. 
That's one of the very first things that God says. It's not good. And so he's saying from the very beginning that we're meant to be in community with one another. We're meant to have one another around. That's how God's designed us to be in relationship. And so this is a really interesting time for us to say, who should I be investing in relationship with? What are the key relationships that I should um, be spending some time in? And what are the ones that I could invest in in a new way? Maybe there's people that you used to see all the time at the school gate who you're not seeing right now. Maybe you could reach out to them. Maybe there's a, a message you could send later today to just reach out to them in a fresh way. Because relationship is at the heart of who God is. It always has been. When we think of God, I think of Father, Son and Holy Spirit who were in relationship together before the world was even created. Through the story of the Bible, we read about the people of Israel who were God's people together. We read about um, the disciples who were in community with Jesus. They lived together. They ate together. They slept out together. Whatever was going on, they did it together. And then we read about the early church. We read about it in Acts, but really we can know about what it should be like now for us as well. How do we do that same community? It's one of the reasons I love small groups. I'm always part of a small group. Um, I've been in small groups for the last, um, I don't know how many years. I think it's a really important part of church because outside of it, you can't have that same level of koinonia or fellowship or togetherness or oneness or sharing life together. As much as we might want to, there's no way we can gather everyone from church and have them round to our house at the same time. It needs to be in smaller groups. And when you do it in smaller groups, you get a, more of a sense of how to share life together, how to be with one another to a different level, to share, to contribute, to be in one another's lives. The thing about the lockdown is it's actually produced some good things as well. I loved hearing Heidi's story about the COVID-19 page on, on Facebook where people in their local wards um, were mobilised to serve one another, to maybe buy prescriptions for one another. What an amazing sense of local community that just wasn't the case beforehand. Also, one of my favourite times of the week is actually Thursdays at eight o'clock. I love stepping out my front door and suddenly seeing all the people that I live on the same street as. The rest of the week, we're all in our own boxes. We're all closed off to the world. It used to be said an Englishman's home is his castle. But it's become something that separates us rather than something that brings us together. And I love it on Thursdays where we can stand up and we can cheer together and we can celebrate the NHS workers, the police and all of the frontline workers that are doing an incredible job. And we can do our bit by staying at home, but by cheering for them. And that sense of community as together we bang on our frying pans or we clap and cheer and, and then afterwards we go, bye neighbour, see you next week. There's something there that's really special and really different. And it makes me think that maybe, maybe in this time, God has a different type of community for us to work out. I've seen stories of people on Facebook saying, I live in a block of flats, I've never spoken to my neighbours. And yet, after the NHS clap this week, we all sang happy birthday to someone who lived on the third floor. And then this happened, and then that happened. It's stories, it's, it's just community happening. Maybe keep your eyes open. Maybe there's something God wants to direct you towards. Maybe there's someone you could reach out to. Someone you could call hello over the fence to. Maybe there's something different for us to do in this time. But I'm sure you're wondering what happens in the book of Acts? What happens after that? Do they manage to keep one heart and one soul and devoted to one another? And so I want to read a couple more passages of what it then looked like for the Acts community to keep developing. And so um, starting with verse 32 says the following, and the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and not one of them claimed that anything belonged to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. And with great power, the apostles were giving witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and abundant grace was on them all. Their expression of godly community, of fellowship, of koinonia, of sharing, contributing, of being together, was the thing that released the blessing of God. We often look at this and go, wow, 3,000 people gave their lives to God. That must have been an incredible time. And we often attribute it to the Holy Spirit being present, being poured out afresh on individual believers' lives 
And it was because of that. That is a key part of our faith and how the church is mobilised. But it's also because of the community that was happening. People realised that actually the church that was gathering was looking after people. It was generous. It was open-hearted. It was authentic community with one another. People began to joyfully think, I could give something that I had. There's a story of Barnabas selling a field he owned and presenting it to the apostles saying, use this for whatever is needed. He didn't need to do that. He saw what God was doing and he wanted to be a part of it. And it was that generous community that meant that the blessing of God could come. The favour of God rested on their generosity to one another, their open heartedness, their open handedness and their connectedness together. And I really believe that God wants us to develop that kind of relationship amongst uh, our church family. Maybe you're um, living on your own right now and that's a real challenge. Or maybe you're living with your family right now and that's a real challenge. Into that context, we have to do what we can to survive day by day and to, to make life work. But I wonder if there's some questions we could ask as well. God, how could we engage authentically in community with other people of faith? How could we be good neighbours? How could we live open-handed and open-hearted? What are there things we could do to serve the kingdom of God and to serve one another? But we can only do it with the Holy Spirit's help. And so it has to start with our connection to God. Maybe you're someone who feels close to God right now. Maybe you feel far away. What I do know is that God wants to encounter you this morning. He wants to bring his life-giving presence into your life, wherever you are, wherever you're watching. And so I'd like to finish by just taking a moment. And if it helps you, do something physical to show that you're responding. I remember on the first week of the live stream, I was watching it in a bedroom. And yet when Ian said, stand up and put your hand on your heart, I loved being able to respond that way. I loved being able to go, OK, this, is, this feels a bit awkward. But I'm going to stand and I'm going to respond. And I felt the Holy Spirit so strongly that day. And so I encourage you, just as I pray to finish, maybe um, just do something physical to show, OK, God, I'm, I'm serious about this. I'm open to you. I'm open to your, your leading, your guiding. I want to know you better. So, Father God, we pray this morning that our lives would reflect the love that Jesus showed. That you would show us, lead us to the people you want us to engage in authentic community with. And Father, may we be known as an open-handed and open-hearted people, a generous people who love you and love one another in such a way that the message of Jesus isn't just spoken of, but it's seen in action. Father, would you help us today? I pray even now you'd be uh, putting people on our minds, on our hearts to reach out to. God, would you show us? And would you help us as we seek to follow you? We seek to be your disciples, following you together. Help us in this strange season. Would you resource us to be your people and to show the love to the world that you so want to show? In Jesus' name, amen.